the sun and you'll get a different view. <laughs> Trust me. Um, but uh, I'd just like to give a very brief uh, overview of why we're here and then uh, I'd like for all of you to hear from your survivors. I know that we have a number of survivors in the room, uh, so many of you are going to hear stories that are, are familiar to some degree. But it's been my experience that the survivors are the ones who are the best at laying the groundwork for why the laws can change. We have what amounts to a national crisis. We have about one-fifth of boys are sexually abused, one-fourth of the girls, although some estimates are a third, uh, and we have only 10% ever going to the authorities. And so the result is that we have a very large number of predators who are capable of working anonymously because the judicial system has never been invoked. And that is not good for the survivors, but it's also not good for the entire society. So what we'd like to do today is to hear from the survivors and then we're going to hear from the problem solvers, uh, Representative Markey and Senator Peterson, and then uh, I'll give a brief overview of national events in this area and then we will uh, open for questions. So I'd like to start with Tony Lembo. Would you like to speak at the podium? Sure. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. Although I was abused by a Catholic priest who was the state police and fire chaplain for the state of Connecticut in 1976, the abuse, the abuse happened here in this city. My friend and I were taken somewhere in the South Bronx and sexually assaulted, but we were not alone. There were eight to 10 other young boys who were already there when we arrived. Since they did not travel with us from Connecticut, I believe they were from New York. I shared in a 43-person settlement in Connecticut that was possible only because the state changed its laws to allow its abused children to come forward for some kind of restitution and long overdue closure. Connecticut chose the right of fair justice for its victimized children over religious organizations who acted as though they were above the law. Over 10,000 people across this country have come forward, and state after state across this nation are standing behind their, their abused children, allowing them to get the restitution and closure they deserve. They are not turning their backs on their citizens. The great state of New York has fought to protect the rights of its citizens since it became a state. And as a proven leader, I know in my heart New York will strengthen its laws in regards to abuse of children and allow a window for justice for all who have suffered. Faced with this crisis in Connecticut, they chose for its citizens, and I am very proud to have been born there. <coughs> Excuse me. As a survivor of priest abuse, I can't imagine how betrayed I would have felt if Connecticut had chosen to protect a religious organization over its citizens. The separation of church and state is really being tested. Our religious organizations have deliberately ignored the laws of the states and are now looking to the states to help them out of a mess they solely created. Our forefathers left England to escape religious tyranny, and in this country the rights of its citizens must come first above the wishes of religious organizations despite the power or money they wield. You're too great of a state not to do the right thing. You have the power to clean up a mess that was not of your making, and I know you have the courage and strength to do it. Having been taken across state lines as a child, I worry for the kids. With the new statute of limitations in Connecticut, 30 years past the date of majority, I'm afraid more children will be taken over the border to New York where the statute is not as severe. Strengthening New York statute will not only protect the children in New York, it will also help to protect all American children. Windows legislation will have benefits beyond restitution for the victims. I can use my case as an example. I did not sign a non-disclosure agreement to obtain a settlement and wrote and published my story. I wanted to expose this man who had tormented so many young boys and had escaped the criminal justice system. The media in Connecticut then took a long, hard look at this man and found signs that he had not changed a bit. State Representative Michael Lawler was quoted as saying, Reverend Stephen Foley is a textbook example, a poster child for a molester continuing in his grooming behavior. I can't imagine any more warning signs than Foley, end quote. There is no telling how many abusers will be stopped as a result of Windows legislation, but rest assured, there will be some. Although criminal prosecution is not likely, if allowed, through the granting of Windows legislation, the civil court system can use all its power to stop this from continuing. The civil court is doing more than just giving away money. They are handing out justice and sending a strong message to those who abuse the law that this will not be tolerated in our state. <clears throat> 
Many of us are not here for the money, for monetary reasons. We are here to stop a predator. If allowed, the civil court system can fix many problems and help heal many people. Thank you. Pat Serrano is going to talk about her experiences and her family's experiences. When our son Mark was a junior at Notre Dame, he read a story in the paper about Gilbert Gote of Louisiana and realized then that he had experienced the same situation. He came home his spring break in 1985, and I was surprised that he did, but uh, he didn't seem troubled. I didn't think anything was there, but I have a very distinct memory of that week when he came home. He wanted to go to the city. We live one hour away, northern New Jersey, and with his dad and I, and spend the day, which I was very happy with that. And at the last minute, we decided to go down the Jersey Shore. And we went to Asbury Park, New Jersey, at dinner, and rode on the famous carousel in Asbury Park that doesn't exist anymore. And the other thing he did that week was go to see the bishop. We didn't know that. And he was told, don't tell your parents about this. They may get upset. No. Oh. And he continued on, and they sent him to, to a, a psychological uh, therapy that summer. We knew nothing about it. And as the mother of seven children, I always enjoyed my life. I always knew where my children were, I thought. And uh, that Thanksgiving, because he was not happy with the way things were going with Bishop Rodheimer, he told his dad. And his dad decided, let's not say anything to mom. We've got a large family. Christmas is coming. I'll tell her at a better time. So at quarter to midnight, New Year's Eve, with a glass of champagne in my hand, he told me. And it was a better time. Because January 16th, Father Jim Hanley's picture was in the Catholic Weekly, with saying mass with little boys around the altar. And that's when he was removed from ministry. Rodiner did not remove him before. They played around with the Mark's age, keeping them away from telling us. And we were naive also until the statute of limitations had told. And uh, it, we, Mark did sue. His lawsuit was to have a policy in case another priest ever did this terrible thing. And they said, yes, they would settle. But we, the three of us, mom, dad, and Mark, had to sign a, a, a confidentiality agreement. Now, our two Catholic lawyers, I'm not quite sure that they did the right thing by us, but that's what we did. So for years, we went on and didn't tell anybody because we were honest, good living people. And those years were very, very difficult for Mark. Difficult for the family, uh, trying to cope with it. Uh, he had a wonderful career that he was doing, but as he has said in the past, he lived another life. He, he uh, while everything was happening to him, he just was transported to another place, and that's how I dealt with it also. I, I had to uh, put it aside. I worked, I owned an office right off the rectory in St. Joseph's in Mendham, and so I had to live a different life every day. And the years went by until finally, uh, at the end of the 90s, I, I couldn't take it anymore, because Father Ken Lash and I used to meet once a week, uh, at, on Tuesdays at 5, and uh, talk about things, and we finally had a seminar we had this man, Ken Wooden came, who talks about child abuse prevention. We had over 400 people come to the high school. Ken Lash got very sick that week, very unusual for the man, and he couldn't get up and introduce him. And I took that as an advantage, and I said, I'm bringing this to you because my son was abused by uh, the pastor of St. Joseph's. And, and never realizing I had broke a confidentiality agreement, but I knew children out there were being abused, and I, we couldn't take it anymore. So uh, the years that have gone by since 1985 have high, high highs and low, low lows. And no different in some respects with, with the call I got in August from a 17-year-old man who now is in Florida but was a Long Island resident who finally told his family that he had been abused. He's afraid his two brothers were, but he's afraid to approach them. So uh, the pain he's gone through all these years, I'm sure, has been similar. And it takes a long time. He is interested in the statute of limitations in New York. And uh, he does get the emails now, and I plan on calling him when I get back from here to show him we're trying